I want to thank Professor Forsdyke. Uh, we, we have decided this evening to, to have the two speakers and, and then have questions together afterwards. Um, I would like to introduce then um, Teresa Plines, who is going to be offering a paper on behalf of her husband, uh, David Plines, who is not able to be with us tonight for reasons of health, uh, to present a paper on Seeking After Darwin, the Loss of Unbelief and George John Romanes. Please welcome Teresa Plines. Would you like to stand for a moment? Okay. <laughs> Don't anybody leave the room. Just <laughs> stretch. My husband, David, deeply regrets not being able to be here this evening. He wanted me to thank the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education for their support of this important work, especially Father Mick McCarthy and Teresa Ladrigan Welpley, and also Oliver Putz, who was instrumental in the planning of this part of the seminar. He also wished me to greet his students in attendance, to wish them well and to express his sadness at not being able to complete his teaching duties to you this quarter. He looks forward to returning to academic life in the fall. And now, his paper, Seeking After Darwin, George John Romanus, and the Loss of unbelief. Professor Forrest Dyke has shown us how Romanus furthered Darwin's science in revolutionary ways. And now we'll explore the more private and secret side of George John Romanus, who, though he was a religious skeptic, struggled deeply with faith questions. The unexpected discovery, after more than a century, of his original memorial poem to Darwin offers a revolutionary way to bring religion and science together. The discovery of the poems took place as my husband was working on a book about Darwin and the debates over Genesis in the 19th century. Our kids love the fact that the publisher also published the Harry Potter series. <laughs> but sorry to say, J.K. Rowling will not be with us this evening. While researching his Darwin book, David first stumbled across some brief excerpts from a memorial poem written by Romanus in honor of Darwin's passing. The poem was part of a little selection of poems put together by his friend T. Herbert Warren of Oxford University shortly after Romanus died. My husband's curiosity was piqued. Who was this Darwinian? And why was he writing religious poetry? The bits of poetry led him on to the biography and letters of Romanus, published by his wife, Ethel. This is an eye-opening volume that charts Romanus' journey from faith 
into skepticism, and then back to faith shortly before his death. But wait, you may say, this was not how the story was supposed to go. Victorians are supposed to grow up naively religious, have a crisis of faith, then be saved by science, and then descend into skepticism, from which they never reemerge. Romanus apparently missed the memo that said Darwin en Darwinism ends in atheism. But did Romanus really return to faith? Some historians think Romanus's wife doctored the facts. Blinded by her piety, they suggest that Ethel cherry-picked the record to make it appear as if her husband was more religious at the end of his life than he really was. End of story. Or so it seems. So was Romanus a Darwinian lulled into a religious stupor by his pushy wife? I wasn't sure about the turn of that phrase. <laughs> but I left it. Or was there something else perhaps stirring in his soul? The answer comes in the form of a memorial poem written to Darwin. Here's an unexpected discovery that can entirely change the way we think about the relation between religion and science. Now, Romanus did not start off a religious skeptic. In fact, just after graduating from Cambridge, he wrote a prize-winning essay on the efficacy of prayer in a world governed by natural laws. Science and religion went hand in hand. But it was his scientific work defending evolution that caught Darwin's attention. Romanus was soon drawn into Darwin's orbit, first by a series of written correspondence, and then by visits to the Darwin family home in the rolling countryside south of London. Here we see in this photo a page from Emma Darwin's daily calendar. In the Saturday slot, she lists Romanus's first visit to their home in 1875 in the company of Thomas Huxley and others. Romanus moved into the inner circle. And in their conversations, Darwin's skepticism about traditional religion made a deep impression on the much younger Romanus. During this time, under the pseudonym of Physicus, Romanus wrote and published a deeply skeptical philosophical tract in which he demolished all the major arguments for God's existence. He argued that Darwinism made belief in God superfluous. This turning toward skepticism was without triumph, however. In his book, he anguished over the fact that for him, the universe now had lost its soul of loveliness. Ironically, in their correspondence, it was Darwin who defended theism against Romanus' attacks. So, was Ethel just imagining things? Other clues started to emerge. Near the end of his life, for example, Romanus became friends with the Reverend Charles Gore, a rather controversial theologian at Oxford. At that late date, Romanus began working on a book that positively assessed theology. 
It was to be called A Candid Examination of Religion by Metaphysicus, a kind of rebuttal to his earlier skeptical treatise, a work he now viewed as the folly of his youth. Unfortunately, the book was never completed. Illness took its toll during those last years as he died prematurely at the age of 46, presumably from a brain tumor. The manuscript passed into the Reverend Charles Gore's hands and was published as part of a collection entitled Thoughts on Religion. Reading this book, we see Romanus taking theology very seriously. If Ethel was doctoring the record, then her husband was conspiring in the doctoring. Now there's quite a gap between his skeptical writing in the 1870s and his theological work in 1893. And here's where the plot thickens. David found, through interlibrary loan, a larger collection of poetry by Romanus. It was one of 50 copies of a book Romanus privately published containing a decade's worth of poetry from 1879 to 1889. The memorial poem to Darwin was stuck right in the middle of the book. Reading what my husband then thought was the complete memorial poem was a revelation, for it was actually 113 poems in length. Herbert Warren's chopped up version he had seen previously hardly did justice to this work. And the great themes were written there for all to see. Darwin's funeral at Westminster Abbey and the burial in the Abbey. The question of Darwin's fame and what was to become of the eternal character of his name. the natural beauty and sacredness of Darwin's residence, Downhouse, located outside of London. And most surprising of all, his wrestling with the problem of evil, bringing together Darwin and God in creative ways. In this more complete version of the poem, we see that Romanus was up to some very creative thinking about reason and faith. My husband took a sabbatical to finish a draft for a book on the topic and thought he was doing pretty well until he made an exciting and unsettling discovery. He was preparing for his summer research trip to the UK to check out Romanus' letters in Oxford when he learned that a London bookseller had put on the market the original typescript of the Darwin Memorial poem, lost for over a century. The manuscript was unknown even to Romanus' descendants. Where in the world had it been? Having just run across the ad, David was dismayed to learn that the work had just been sold after being on the market only a few weeks. His sadness turned to joy when he learned that Henry Sotherans, another London bookseller, had purchased the work and had put it back on the market. But then reality sank in as the list price was far beyond a religion professor's book budget. <laughs> a student of the graduate program in pastoral ministries, however, 
kindly stepped forward, rescuing the day by purchasing the TypeScript. And we were off on an adventure. The trip became an unexpected exploration of the world of George Romanus. In Edinburgh, for instance, you can still find the business founded by his grandfather, called Romains and Patterson, that made the family a fortune selling textiles to the gentry. It remains one of the best tourist shops in the city. And there's Greyfriars Cemetery in Edinburgh that contains an important family funeral monument. David credits our son, Andres, who scoured the grounds and shouted out that he'd found it. And though deteriorated, the panel with the grandfather's name contains valuable information about the family. His death is listed in 1848, when his son, Romanus's father, was in Canada, serving as a minister for the Church of Scotland. The other panel tells us that the younger George Romanus was born shortly after his grandfather died and that a year later, another son, age 10, also died. So all at once, the family faced the grandfather's death, the inheritance of a great fortune, a new baby boy, and the loss of another child to tragedy. The combination sent them packing for home. But they didn't head back to Scotland as one might expect. With the help of their large inheritance, they had enough money to take up residence in the posh Regent's Park neighborhood of London. This is a shared slide here. The building still exists today. An end unit just sold for $120 million. Other units are still available, if you're interested. <laughs> and here's Regent's Park, conveniently located just across the street. But on the other side of the park is the church where Romanus, despite his skepticism, attended services. It's the old Christ Church now known as St. George's Orthodox Cathedral. The family did not entirely abandon Scotland, living at Dunscave House in the Scottish Highlands during the summer. Here, Romanus wrote his Cambridge essay on prayer and later set up a research lab for his work in marine biology. Sadly, this house burned down in the 1960s. After Darwin died, Romanus rented another house in the Highlands from a relative. And it was in this idyllic setting that he began his work on the memorial poem. The residence, Ganey's house, remains to this day in much the same state as in Romanus's time. Here, Romanus would hold regular religious services for family and household staff, since the nearest town was 10 miles away, reading sermons of famous theologians if a minister wasn't on hand. This despite his skepticism. And we found when we visited that very curiously, a Christian book publisher runs an office out of the house today. When Romanus wandered down to the coast to do research, he would pass through these curious arches with their looming crosses, reminding him daily that faith and science 
met on his biological excursions. Returning to London, David made his pilgrimage to Henry Sotheran's booksellers. And what he found there was nothing short of amazing. The type script was in excellent condition. A smallish, leather-bound volume with hand-lettered corrections, notes, and unpublished poems. Romanus had penned his name and address inside the front cover so that people like Francis Darwin, Charles Darwin's son, would know where to return the manuscript after reading it. Some of the marginal comments in the typescript do appear to be those of Francis's hand. The final page bears the stamp of Lycée Monchablon, the woman who produced the typescript. She was one of the first women to use the latest technology, a Remington typewriter. She ran her own typing business in London, as well as a school to train women typists. Each page of the typescript seemed to contain some new wrinkle. The poem begins with the somber tolling of the funeral bell, here corrected in Romanus's own hand. The hour of midnight struck upon the chime, and as the bell threw up his iron throat to speak with iron voice the doom of time, each solemn clang upon my spirit smote and left it listening in a solitary dread while all the shadowed stillness of the night stood trembling as though some angel spoke relentless stern and terrible in right who gave the message in that steady stroke then left its rolling sound through all the world to spread. Darwin is praised as the solid rock of truth where the human race finally found its bearings. Darwin is laid to rest in a sacred place where many worthies were gathered, such as the second Duke of Argyle, a famous orator and fellow, fellow countryman to Romanus. The poet asks, what sort of fame did Darwin enjoy? Certainly not the crass sort of honors sought by warriors such as Admiral Vernon, who led his forces to terrible defeat in South America. His monument in Westminster Abbey may have sanitized the truth of the horrifying waste of life. But in the memorial poem, Romanus denounces the folly of British imperial ambitions. Darwin's fame, instead, was a positive life force that guided and infused his work, bringing benefits to all the world. And then there were the handwritten poems scattered throughout the text. This particular poem speaks of the pain Romanus felt in Darwin's passing. Having enjoyed Darwin's friendship for nearly a decade, Romanus anguished over this loss. The sonnet speaks with a poignant intensity, here with the words, too late, too late, forevermore, 
too late. Many poems contain sublime religious revelations. In this poem, set at Westminster Abbey, a beam of light pierces the stained glass. In the window, the figure of hope appears as a maid. The light from the window falls onto Darwin's tomb. It is Easter Day, nearly a year since Darwin's death, and Romanus is still agonizing. Was there some hidden message in this moment? Romanus wondered. Darwin was buried next to the great astronomer, John Herschel. The poetry speaks a sense of awe. It is as if the grave next to Herschel had been waiting for an equal to join him in death. Some of the poems concern artworks devoted to Darwin. One set of five poems reflects on this painting by John Collier, now hanging in the Linnaean Society in London. Romanus had, in fact, helped raise money to compensate Collier for his efforts. Here, Romanus admires the living glow captured by the artist. And in another poem in the set, Romanus speaks of Darwin's deep-roofed eyes that gaze into planetary time. Romanus's pilgrimage to Darwin's residence on the anniversary of his death impressed Romanus with a vision of divine light. Wandering in Darwin's footsteps, Romanus found his lost friend still alive in all of nature. Romanus also offered a meditation on this famous statue sculpted by Sir Joseph Bain, now in the Natural History Museum in London. Handwritten, this poem was probably composed in 1885, shortly after the statue was unveiled. Reflecting on the turmoil raised by Darwin's ideas, Romanus saw in the gathering at the statue's unveiling the hope for a new convergence around Darwin's thought. The collection of 127 poems, some omitted from the printed version, are a mixture of loss, religious insight, and new ways to bring faith and science together. In the final section, they also offer meditations on the problem of evil in creation. This intense handwritten sonnet reflects on the fiercely brooding spirit at work in creation, bringing good out of evil. The process of natural selection becomes a mysterious part of the creator's work. And the memorial poem ends with this remarkable confession of faith. Who art thou, Lord? We know thee not. We only know thy work is vast, and that amid thy worlds our lot, unknown to us, by thee is cast. We know thee not, yet trust that thou dost know the creature thou hast made, and wrote the truth upon his brow to tell thy thoughts by worlds unsaid. 
So help me, Lord, for I am weak, and know not how my way to grope. My thoughts have fallen lame and meek, and turn at last to thee in hope. Teach me, I have not understood. Thy ways are ways past finding out. Our wisdom still shall trust them good and in the darkness slay the doubt. Through this poetry, Romanus shows us that there are truths that stand beyond the limits of science. He invites us to take the leap into the unknown, with Darwin pointing the way. For more insights and a complete rendering of the memorial poem, you can see David's book that will be due out this summer. He was fortunate to have the novelist Emma Darwin, a descendant of the famous Charles and Emma, as an editor for the book. Through Donald Forsdyke's kindness, he was also in touch with Romanus' heirs. His granddaughter, Mrs. Joan Westmacott, now recently deceased, and Helena Green, his great-granddaughter in Cambridge, have been very supportive of this project. David was delighted to be able to discuss this poetry with Mrs. Westmacott in the last year of her life. Darwin and Romanus were seekers. Darwin wanted to know why we were religious. And he argued that our religious sense has evolved. Our relig religiosity is natural. George Romanus sought an eternal religious truth in Darwinism. And by the end of his life discovered that Darwin showed him how to be an intellectually fulfilled theist. The poetry is a game changer, and Santa Clara University is very fortunate to own it. Our symposium is inspired by the acquisition of this manuscript, and the themes of the conference reflect ideas central to Romanus's poem. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Alfred Lane, who most generously purchased the typescript for our university. Thank you. And you are all invited to view the manuscript at tomorrow's library exhibit. It's really interesting to look at this with all the, the notes and the crossings out. And you can just see how he's wrestling with this. So it's worth taking a look at it. And to conclude, George Romanus offers us a fresh way to think about religion in a Darwinian key. The path toward this new vision for theism, it turns out, is found by going through Darwin, not against him. We are reminded of the words of the great poet Alfred Tennyson. There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. Thank you. <laughs>